Let us join together in prayer. Lord of everything bright and beautiful, we thank you for all that is contained in this day, for the assortment of people called us, whom you hold together like the body with many parts, for the joy in our hearts, the grief in our eyes, and the surprises that go with faith, for the privilege we each get to know in being a neighbor to those who are in need. Today, help us to discover the treasure of your grace, hidden in unsuspecting places, even within our own ordinariness. As a shovel turns the soil to reveal a buried seed, turn our lives inside out. Grant that in so doing, the gift of your quiet presence would move us to greater faith. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that the very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness, or peril, or sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through God who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of the Lord. This day is from St. Matthew's account, the 13th chapter. 
where Jesus says a parable. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid, and then in his joy goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Or again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, and on finding one pearl of great value, goes and sells all that he has and buys it. Have you understood all of this? And the people answered, yes. And he said to them, therefore every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, to you Christ. Christ. Please be seated. Our trumpeter for today, by the way, Bobby Lewis, uh, had major back surgery back in what, February? Some time ago. He scheduled it so he could be here today. This is his first time back playing, and we're just delighted. Grace and peace to all of you uh, from Jesus the Christ. I know these jazz musicians pretty well uh, since we've spent so many years together, but I really don't know much about their childhoods, specifically their beginnings in the world of music as kids. But I think of that this morning because I called to mind, your mind, a, a study that was done by this man named uh, Gary McPherson, a really interesting research project he did in 1997. He randomly selected 157 children who were preparing to select and then learn a musical instrument. And he wanted to figure out how these students progressed in their musicianship. Some of them grew in the subsequent 17 years to be pretty significant musicians. Others of them faltered. Still others pretty summarily quit. So he searched for the traits, this McPherson guy did, he searched for the traits that would separate those from those who progressed and those who did not. It turns out that IQ is not a very good predictor of one's long-term proficiency in music, nor, believe it or not, Jerry Coleman is rhythm or mathematics or anything such. The single best predictor for someone's future musicianship uh, came from a single question that McPherson asked the students before they even chose an instrument, how long do you think you will play? Now, for those students who planned to play for a very short time, they didn't become proficient at all. For those who said that they envisioned playing for a number of years, they were moderately successful. And for those students who said, I want to be a musician, I want to play my whole life, these students, they took off. They soared. The sense of desire that these students brought to their very first lesson was the spark that would trigger all kinds of goodness, all kinds of improvement in the subsequent years. Which brings me to this question, how do you create desire in another person? Or how do you create desire in your own life, for that matter? How do you long for something that is so great that you're willing to define your whole life around that something? Computers, to use a, an inanimate object, computers have no desire. They have no neurological capacity to show curiosity. They have no capacity for restlessness like we can have when we're inquiring people and when we're curious. Yeah, you can program a computer depending on the software you, you put into it. You can make a computer do certain things, but you cannot create desire in a computer. You cannot create desire in your cell phone either, for that matter. 
And yet, I want to suggest to you this morning that desire is an indispensable part of our lives and a critical part of the Christian life. Not simply if you want to have a shot at becoming a, a really fine musician, but if you want to become, if you want to be changed from one kind of person to another kind of person. And if you want to know and love God, well, without desire, there is no such thing as faith. You may have the language of faith, we may have the external trappings of faith, but there is no faith if desire at some level and in some measure is not present. A man stepped into my office before Christmas, and it was one of these vivid conversations where he talked quickly about the unraveling of his life. Two failed marriages, no relationship to speak of between him and his father and his sister, the only two surviving relatives in his uh, immediate family. A great guy on the inside. Now, I can help this man get a new life. I cannot, however, give him the desire to want a new life. Desire is this mysterious and this often elusive trait that allows us to be changed from one person to become another person. Jacques Ellul, the great uh, French philosopher and sociologist who wrote a jillion books, he said one time that if your guts do not ache for what you say that you hope for, well, then you're really not hoping at all. Which is to say, if your guts do not ache for more sustainable environmental practices, let's say, in your household or in your life, no matter how much you hope for those things, if your gut doesn't ache, they're not coming. If your guts do not ache for an end to the gun violence that seems to be marking every single weekend right now in the city of Chicago, or if your gut does not ache for some sort of safe and good future for these Central American kids, whether on this land or in their land, if our guts do not ache, you know, like the gallstone sort of ache for these sorts of outcomes, well, we may be fairly adept at talking about all these matters, but we're really not hoping for the outcomes that we're talking about, at least not in the deep biblical sense of hope. We're more busy chattering about them than hoping for them. If your gut does not ache, you're not really hoping for what you say you hope for, said Jacques Ellul. Do you hope that God will inspire us? I mean, people like St. Paul or you in your individual life? Do you hope that God will inspire us to work towards repairing some of the brokenness of this world? Do your guts ache for this? I mean, really ache for this? This is an important question. For if you long to know and love God more fully, do not let go of this desire. Do not let go of this pursuit. Do not let go of this quest. For it is precious because it's the beginning of faith. Richard Seltzer, whom some of you have surely read, this surgeon and um, author who's always advocating for humane ways in which medical students can learn the trade. He was asked one time about his, his faith life. And Seltzer replied in, with these words. He said, my entire life has been one long search for faith and I have not found it. I do not believe in God. But I am jealous, frankly. I feel as though I have missed out on the greatest thing that can happen to a person, faith in God. It must be wonderful. So how does this great gift of God become yours? How does it become mine? It begins with desire. It begins with our own willingness, our own eagerness to be changed from one kind of person into another kind of person. It's this simple desire that is the beginning 
of faith. The scripture for this morning that you just heard from, from St. Matthew's gospel account, where Jesus ticks off these very quick little descriptors for uh, parables. And each and every one of them begins with, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, if we read that verse, like a treasure buried beneath a field, like a merchant who finds this precious pearl, and so forth. The kingdom of heaven, or sometimes it will say the kingdom of God is like. And if you can, do anything in your power not to think of kingdom as a place, like a place above the earth, or a place apart from the world, or some otherworldly location. When we pray in the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, what we're praying for is what life might look like on earth if God were ruling things and the decision makers and the power brokers and the rulers of this world were not. The kingdom, or the way of God, if you will, is an alternative to the way things happen to work in this world under the rulers we have. So since there's no way to say exactly what the kingdom is, since we're all different people, Jesus simply says the kingdom is like a treasure that's buried in a field. It's like this pearl that a particular merchant finds. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure in a field which someone found and hid, and then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and he buys that field. Or again, says Jesus, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. And on finding one pearl of great value, he goes and sells all that he has and buys it. Who knows exactly what that treasure in the field is and why the man reburies it before actually purchasing the field. Jesus doesn't tell us these details and like every parable, it's, there's some imagination of yours and mine that is required. But notice with this parable of the treasure and the parable of the merchant with the pearl, each of these two individuals finds something that makes everything else he has or knows or owns trivial. Everything else is trivial. The desire to have that something drives these two individuals to unload all of their possessions. Now here I want to challenge you to rethink something that I'm pretty sure is deeply embedded in your minds. And I'm thinking of the whole notion of sacrifice. These parables on the surface, they look like two individuals who are sacrificing all their possessions to get that one darn treasure under the dirt, or that one pearl of great value. Since ancient times, human beings have venerated sacrifice. Sacrifice is a way of life. Sacrifice is a way of doing business. We believe that for one thing to flourish, something else must die. That's what's behind the whole notion of sacrifice. Something has to die, or it has to bleed, or it has to hurt, or it has to suffer in order for something else to flourish, something else to live. So we regularly hear our president and our government officials call on this sacrificial rhetoric. They gave their lives for the country, right? Someone must die so that others might live. Spiritually speaking, we use the language of sacrifice. We give up something in order to have life, something dear to us so that we might get closer to God. You give this up, you'll get that. That's the idea of sacrifice. In the parable, clean out the garage, sell everything, maybe I can get that treasure under the soil. Our belief is that God loves sacrifice. And we're heavily influenced by this belief. For one thing to flourish, another thing must die. It underlies so much of Christian morality the sacrifice principle. It might be good for business. It might be good for motivating salespeople to get more time on the road and less time with the family. 
It might be a great way to inspire patriotism. It might be a great way to win a baseball game if you want to catch a sacrifice fly. But sacrifice does not make us better lovers. What child wants to hear his or her parents say, I sacrificed for you? No, that's not what they need to hear. Part of me died so that you can live. This doesn't feel like love. What a child wants to hear is from a parent is, whatever I did for you, I did out of love. I do out of love. That's a huge difference. We're driven to believe that sacrifice is good and it's beautiful and it's necessary. But sacrifice is more about death and loss and hurt and suffering than it is about more life. Sacrifice is not required to make something good and worthwhile. You know what's required to make something good and worthwhile? Joy is. That's right. Joy. And what God gives in the form of a gift, it's not this exchange so that we can flourish. It's God's love that makes this meal happen, which we don't refer to as a sacrifice, but as a gift. God means for us to understand this meal as love. Maybe other gods want sacrifice, but not Jesus. Jesus says, I want mercy, not sacrifice. Read the Old Testament. God says, I do not desire sacrifice. And so what do we get? We get this God of awesome love. Now about that treasure in the field. What if that treasure, which Jesus never tells us what it is, what if that treasure is, is you? What if it's you that's buried beneath all of your stuff and, and the layers of prejudice and the sins that you and I tend to accumulate? What if we are the treasure under that soil and God will do anything to get that treasure? God will love and love and love to get that treasure. Not sacrifice so much as give the gift and take the time that it takes to love us just as we are. What if that's the treasure? We're going to sing about this in just a moment. And in that hymn, we're going to sing, Riches I heed not, nor vain empty praise. Thou mine inheritance, now and always. Thou and thou only, first in my heart. Great God of heaven, my treasure thou art. The desire of that hymn, the desire to know and love this God who loves us, buried as we are beneath all of our problems. This is a gift, folks. It's a gift not of sacrifice, but of grace. So let's sing of this vision. Amen.